Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to this evening study, Friday night, um, September 22nd. And uh, the fall equinox is going to happen in about, uh, uh, let's see, it's about 11. Let me see, that's about 12 hours and 45 minutes from now. It'll be fall, well, be the fall equinox. And, um, you know, a lot has been happened this last week in this movement, um, but we're going to focus here on the message that was given in 1895 by A.T. Jones, uh, the third angel's message. And um, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can once again come before you especially as the Sabbath is approaching here, and I know it's Sabbath for many already. And we are, are grateful for the light that has come from your word that has revealed to us our sinfulness and our dependency upon you. We know, Lord, that we face a struggle with self every day and that Christ has overcome on our behalf and that we can connect with his power. We just pray, Lord, that as we continue this reading of A.T. Jones' material from 1895, that we can see its relevance for us today. And Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to strengthen us, to convict us, and to bring a Christ's righteousness to us. I pray for each person, Lord, who is searching for truth. I pray that you can guide them. And uh, that you can be here now as we read together. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so good evening again. So this is A.T. Jones, um, Third Angel's Message, number 24. And uh, Jones is going to continue on some of the things that he's been talking about. Obviously, he's he's a logical thinker. He goes through progressively. Uh, but he says, the text for tonight is Acts 10, 28. And he said unto them, you know how that it is, unlawful, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, this is going to be an important study here as we look at our relations to each other. <clears throat> He says, the interlinear Greek that I have shows that this was spoken really stronger than our translation gives it. He said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a man, a Jew, to unite himself or come near to one of another race. Not simply, you know that it is an unlawful thing, but you know how unlawful it is to do so. Now, was it unlawful? Was it unlawful for a Jew to keep, com keep company or associate with one of another race. The Jews regarded it as being unlawful, but was it unlawful? The Jews were God's people. They had professed to be his people for ages. By this time, they should have learned that whatever God said, and that alone was lawful, and that nothing that anybody else should say had any force of law, therefore could never properly be spoken of as lawful. And consequently, any violation of it could never be spoken of as unlawful. They should have learned that. But instead of learning it, they learned to oppose it, or they learned the opposite of it. And so entirely opposite was it that what man said was really counted as more binding than what God himself said. Man's commandments, man's customs, and man's ways made void the word of God itself, even as Je Jesus said, ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now, Christ in his work, which he did in the world, and which he has done in himself for all who are in him, was just the reverse of that whole order of things. He turned the matter so as to bring men to see what man, or any collection of men may say, cannot be spoken of as lawful, and has no place in the Christian category as lawful, or the disregard of it as unlawful. But what God alone says, that alone is lawful. 
and not to do what he says, that alone is unlawful. Now, this, this is the principle that we are going to examine in a study or two, maybe more. And this is the principle we need to examine now because we have come to the borders of time, of the time, and shall soon be fully into the time when the world will be bound as entirely under men's commandments and men's traditions and men's prejudices, which make void the law of God as those people were when Christ came into the world. Now, we can see that clearly that this is speaking of our time. If you're going to talk about the making void of God's law, where that which is good is considered unlawful and that which is evil is considered good, then we're, we're in pretty bad shape. And we're definitely in that time now. So he says, um, which made the void, void the law of God as those people were when Christ came into the world. And therefore, as certainly as our allegiance shall be to him, it must be as it must be. So certainly we will be drawn so close to what God says that that alone will be our whole rule and definition of conduct. That alone will be our guide and that in Christ, as it is lived in Christ and wrought out in him. And when that shall be so with the world, wedded to forms and ceremonies and traditions by which they make void the law of God, they will deal with those who do concerning their traditions as Christ did concerning the others, as they did in that day with him. Therefore, it was never God's purpose that it should be counted unlawful to associate uh, with people of other nations. And if the Jews had remained faithful to God, it would never have been counted by any one of them unlawful to associate or have anything to do with one of another nation. They had come to this position by a direct shutting of their eyes and a turning of their backs upon the Lord's dealings and God's teaching from the beginning and all the way down. Now, why did they get to that point that they didn't want to associate with people of other nations? What was their reasoning? Why was it that way in Christ's day? What had happened to them? I know they've been uh, harassed by other nations. Okay. Rome and, and uh, Medo-Persia, I believe. Okay. But in the past, they had departed from God because of their relations with other nations, right? If you look at the story of Ezra, the marriage to the strange wives, etc. So, So often their relations with other nations led to them worshiping the idols and the gods of other nations, right? So what the Jews tried to do to protect that from happening was to make themselves exclusive, to cut themselves off from interaction with other nations, especially on any kind of social level. doesn't mean they didn't sell them things um, or interact with them in that way, but they definitely were not going to um, be in any way social with them. Now, that wasn't really the answer to the problem. Or sharing their faith. They didn't want to share their faith. Yeah. So, you know, they drove out of one ditch into the other, um, you know, overcorrected. The problem was, initially, is uh, their faithfulness to God. It wasn't so much that they had contact with other nations, but they weren't obedient to God. And... Yes, it's true that, you know, marrying other uh, nations, wives, you know, their, their, or daughters, making them your wives, uh, that's definitely going to affect you because that woman is going to raise those children and she's going to have those beliefs and your children are going to grow up with these this influence uh, from the pagan nations. And, and we see this within Adventism too. We can see that Adventism to some degree is, has made itself exclusive um, even when I became an Adventist, I wasn't really included in into Adventism, right? 
I, w- I wasn't on the in circle, the in crowd. You mean like a little, like little cliques, cliques or spiritual elites in the church? Because I'm just, a, in a sense, an outsider. I'm a proselyte, right? Now, I didn't really notice this until I got married to Heidi, who is a fourth generation Adventist, how different she's treated uh, by the leadership of the church, um, you know, because, I mean, they know all of her family. Many of her family were ministers, right, uh, relatives. So, so all of a sudden, you know, I have a different status, even though I'm, you know, on the outside in the sense theologically. Uh, definitely there's a different status that happens when you're a generational Adventist than when you're just somebody who's a proselyte. And um, so, so Adventism has sort of made this exclusiveness. Plus, they don't really know how to interact or perceive the world around them. They don't really understand uh, people who are different. They don't, don't understand other Christians. Um, and so they've always had this exclusiveness in the sense of they're better than others and, um, and, and just sort of a, a simplistic view of the world around them. So I've noticed this about Adventists. Um, you know, the, the ones who've been Adventists for a long, long time. So it's, it's those, those who have been born and raised in the church would do that most, mostly, I think. I used to be, I used to be a Catholic and Baptist. <laughs> yeah. So, so people who are born into the church don't necessarily understand the world outside of them, especially if, you know, they've just gone to church schools their whole life. Um, all their friends are Adventists and, and they can be not even converted Christians, but but culturally, they're Adventists. And this is what ends up happening with the Jews. So they need to be converted. They need to understand the gospel. But the gospel keeps getting set aside. And they try to preserve their culture, their religion, with all of these traditions that they add to it. Now, in some ways, Jones isn't really understanding at the end of the world because when we look at these traditions and forms and ceremonies, that's not necessarily what makes void the law of God at the end of the world. Uh, it is the laws of men. The laws of men are in contra, contradistinction to the law of God. Right? They, uh, they're definitely different than the law of God, uh, but they're placed above God's law. And so they're not necessarily even traditions. In the, in the truest sense, because traditions are things that have carried on for a long time. A lot of these things are just new radical ideas that have replaced God's law. So uh, he says, and when that shall be so, when the world wedded to forms and ceremonies and traditions by which they make void the law of God, they will deal with those who do concerning the traditions as Christ did concerning the others as they did in that day with him. Therefore, it was never God's purpose that it should be counted unlawful to associate with people of other nations. We should associate with people, whoever they are, but we associate with them in a different level. Obviously, we're not going to, you know, find worldly friends and, you know, go to the bar with them and and all those types of things. But we still are in contact with other people. We need to we need to mingle with those around us. We need to bring a godly influence and the jews weren't really doing that they were just cutting themselves off from any kind of relation uh, to the nations around them okay so they shut their eyes as he says um, um and turning and turned their backs upon the lord's dealings and god's teachings from the beginning and all the way down so this wasn't really a good way to preserve uh, their beliefs, their faith. Just look at a moment at the position of the Jews as set forth by Peter in the text, which was the expression of the whole idea of the Jewish nation. In their estimation, all the nations were shut away from God and had no place at all with him. Yet all the way along, the Lord had been constantly showing them that this was not so at all. In the days of Jonah, and the glory of the kingdom of Assyria, before the kingdom of Babylon had come into history at all, Way back there, God called one of his people, Jonah, to go to that heathen nation and tell them of the doom that was hanging over them and the destruction that was to come. If by means of the warning they might repent and escape the ruin. 
He said to the Lord, there's no use for me to do that because thou art a gracious God and repenteth thee of the evil. And if I go over there and tell them what you have told me to tell them, and if they repent of the evil and turn from their wickedness, you will not destroy the city. What then is the use of my going on that journey to tell them that the city will be destroyed? You will not do it if they turn from their evil ways. But the Lord insisted that he should go to Nineveh. But he, still holding to the views, started off to Joppa to go to Tarshish. Uh, the Lord brought him back. And by that time, he was convinced that he would be better to go to Nineveh. He went to Nineveh and entered the city. Three days journey, preaching. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Word came to the king of Nineveh, and he sent word to all the people to turn from their evil ways, put on sackcloth and ashes, and cause even the animals to fast, and to have the people cry mightily unto God. The Lord heard their cry, accepted their repentance, and saved the city. Jonah went out and sat on a height before the city to see whether God was going to destroy it, and he did not destroy it. And then Jonah didn't like it at all. He said, now that is just what I told you before I started. I told you that if I came here and told them what you told me to tell them, they would repent of the evil and you would forgive them and not destroy their city. And it came out that way. And I would have better stayed at home. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways. And God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them. And he did it not. But he displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Then he tells how Jonah went out and sat on the east side of the city and there made a booth and sat under it until he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a gourd and it withered. And Jonah got very angry about that and prayed again that he might die. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast pity on the gourd. Uh, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, where I know more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? So you got 120,000 people in Nineveh. Um, anyway, it says, well, it is supposed that Jonah himself learned this lesson finally and further. This was recorded and it was kept as one of the holy books in the hands of the people from which they were taught. And they should have learned the lesson which it taught that the Lord had a care for other nations and that he wanted his people to care for other nations. Jonah knew and said that he knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Knowing that. He should have been that much more ready to go to those people and preach to them the Lord's message that they might repent and be delivered. But in spite of that book, which they had, and in spite of that lesson, which it positively taught, from that day forward, they went directly opposite to it. They thought that God cared not for the heathen, except as they became his Jews. And the Savior told those who thought that way that the proselyte they had compassed the sea and land to make was twofold more the child of hell than they themselves. It was so. Um, I don't quite understand that sentence. Okay, it just says, okay, I get it. So they thought that God cared not for the heathen, except as they became Jews, Right. And, and Christ told them that you search, you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, but they become two, four more the child of hell than you are yourselves, right? Which is um, to say that basically uh, their conversion of that person didn't really help them. After that, they went on in their crooked course away from the true idea of God respecting them and the nations around and became so self-inclusive so shut up within themselves and so evil 
as to be worse than the heathen around them. Then the Lord scattered them among all the nations around them, and they were obliged to associate with other people. They had to do it. And yet Peter says, you know how unlawful it is for a man, a Jew, to unite himself or come near to one of another race with men that were uncircumcised? In the 11th chapter, the brethren at Jerusalem charged him, thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. Daniel and his three brethren had eaten at a heathen king's table and with heathen day in and in out for years. And God was with them all the time. Now, of course, Daniel and his friends were taken captive. It wasn't by choice, but um, and made Daniel one of the great prophets. And he delivered the three from the fiery furnace. Now, what was that recorded for and put in their hands for as one of the books which they were constantly to study? You can see that it was simply to teach them directly the opposite of what they were saying and doing. More than this, turn to the book of Daniel, fourth chapter. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. That is Nebuchadnezzar preaching to all nations, kindreds, and languages the truth as to the true God and how good he is and how great his wonders are. They had this in their hands. They had this in their own records that God had given Nebuchadnezzar a dream and, had da and given Daniel the interpretation of the dream for the king. And that by this means, God had brought Nebuchadnezzar to this place where he sends forth a proclamation, proclamation to all nations and languages, telling how good the true God is, how great he is. And how good it is to trust him. Look at the last verses of that chapter. Nebuchadnezzar has told his experience. How he offended against God and was driven out. And the Lord brought him back in his own good time. At the same time, my re reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought me. And I was established in my kingdom. An excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Yeah, so um, Angela adds here, God violated the Jewish exclusivism snobbery so much he used Esther to woo and win a heathen king who would counteract the death decree. Yeah. Now, I just want to say on, on the other side of this, we see within Adventism, um, even going back to the 1950s, uh, the courting of the evangelicals. Um, now, you would think, well, Adventists want to interact with other Christians. And they, they begin doing this. They go to their universities. Um, but like Bacchioke, Bacchioke did that. He went to a Catholic uh, a university. But they're doing that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Now, they're doing that to gain, gain the acceptance of the world. Right. That is, they don't want to be seen as a cult Adventists. Yeah. And, and they want to have the status that they can have by being recognized by other scholars of other denominations. And that, of course, is not what Jones is talking about as far as interacting with others, right? Jones wouldn't support the idea of learning in, in the other church's schools, in the churches of fallen Babylon. So you have these two extremes, the one where you, you become exclusive and this other one where you just have no distinction. That is, you don't even recognize that what they're teaching is error. You accept their gods, so to speak. And this is a problem is that people go to these extremes. <clears throat> um, there was a lesson then constantly before them by which the Lord was trying to teach them that all these nations of theirs uh, were directly the opposite of the truth. He was teaching them 
all these notions of theirs that didn't make any sense. All these notions of theirs were directly the opposite of the truth. He was teaching them that he was ready to reach the heathen and wanted to reach them. And that he had separated Israel from among the nations that they might know more of him and tell it to all nations. And if they had stood in the place where God wanted them to stand from the beginning, no such task as this would ever have fallen to the heathen king, but the people of God themselves would have proclaimed his glory to all the nations. So the problem we have within Adventism, just in, in the general sense, going back to what I was talking about, is that the Adventists, if they had stood their ground and not courted the evangelicals and sought to pacify them in regard to um you know, how they see us as a cult. If they would have just proclaimed the gospel, they would have been much more effective in in spreading the truth. That is, if they had the truth, they'd be much more effective in spreading the truth. But they didn't do that. They, they were not doing that. And they always have this reason. The reason we're doing it is so that we can have influence. Because if they think we're a cult, then they're not going to listen to us. So, so we compromise thinking that that's going to uh, give us an in, make us equals with them so that we can participate and influence them. But they're going to end up influencing us in that context. But when they shut themselves away from God and in all that shut themselves away from the nations, then God had to use the heads of these na heathen nations to bring the knowledge of himself to all the nations. Look at the sixth chapter also. There is the instance of Darius in the persecution of Daniel and his deliverance. Let us read the decree of Darius in the 25th verse. Then King Darius wrote unto all peoples and nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be unto you. Be, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. <clears throat> and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lion? There again, the knowledge of the true God is made known to all peoples, nations, and languages. By the word of one, who to the Jews was an outcast, utterly forsaken and repudiated of God, but there it stood in their own language, in their own hands, year after year, and it was ever teaching them the opposite of the things that they were teaching and doing. One more instance related in the first chapter of Ezra. We will read in connection with the last two verses of the last chapter of second chronicles now in the first year of cyrus king of persia that the word of the lord spoken by the mouth of jeremiah might be accomplished the lord stirred up the spirit of cyrus king of persia that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying thus saith cyrus king of persia all the kingdoms of the earth hath the lord god of heaven given me and he hath charged me to build him an house in jerusalem which is in judah who is there among you of all his people Lord, his God, be with him and let him go up. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord, stored, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him in a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Ezra 1 verse 1 to 3. That is enough. There are plenty more instances in the scriptures to show how entirely the Jews had shut their eyes and turn their backs upon the Lord in order to reach the point where they stood when Christ came into the world and where he found them. That is true that in the books of Moses, when the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and in other scriptures, 
it was told them that they were to be separate from all the nations. And that is so. It is all. It is also told them how that separation was to be accomplished. In the 33rd chapter of Exodus, in verses 14 to 16, this is told. My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. So shall we be separated. How is it that so? Thou goest with us. Thus they were taught the means by which they should be separated from all the people. Now, if they had courted his presence and also had his presence with them, they would have been separated from all the people, indeed, in heart and in life. Yet they would have associated with all the people upon the earth. They would have gone to all people and nations and languages and tongues, telling them of the glories of God and his goodness and power, just as Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and Cyrus did. But instead, they did not court his presence and have him ever with them to sanctify them, for to be separated from the world unto the Lord is to be sanctified. If they had had the Lord's presence to sanctify them, they could have gone anywhere on the earth, and still they would have been separate from all the people. But not having that which would separate them, and which alone could separate them, then if they were to be separated from the world, how was it to be done? How alone could it be done? We know they did not have him whose presence alone could do it. The only way then by which it could be done at all was for them to do it themselves according to their own ideas of what God meant when he said they should be separated. But a man's ideas of what God means, we know how near the truth they are. For he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. So it is as far away from the truth as man can get. Having not the presence of God to do it for them and in them, they took it upon themselves, and they had to take it upon themselves to do it if they were to be separated at all. But when they did not have the presence of God, which alone could do it, then they're attempting to separate themselves. What alone could it do? Think. Now, what alone could that end in? It could not possibly end in anything else than the building up, the enlarging, the great overtopping growth of self, self-confidence, self-pride, self-exaltation, self-righteousness, every kind of selfishness, more and more increasing upon itself, and all in the vain effort of themselves to fulfill the scriptures by which the Lord had said that they should be separated from all the nations. So if we think about this in the context of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in the context of proselytizing, so when we get a proselyte, we, we have somebody become a member of our church, a convert. They enter into a church that the, even the means by which we evangelize them is to join this exclusive group that knows the truth so that you can be better than the people around you. Now, maybe that's a bit harsh, but that's when the first evangelistic series I went to, I was already an Adventist. So I think it was, so I got baptized in December of uh, December 25th, 82. And the first evangelistic series that I went to would have been in um, would have been in eighty four. So it would have been about a year and a half. So it was in the spring, maybe not quite a year and a half, the spring of eighty four. And um, I remember going to this evangelistic series and thinking, if I had gone to an evangelistic series, the one thing I would not have done is become a Seventh Day Adventist. even though what they were presenting was truth, the prophecies and so forth. But the manner in which this was presented was the thing that I found distasteful. 
because it was from a position of self-righteousness that we are better. And the people that it attracted were the ones that wanted to have that sort of character. It wasn't going to attract the people that should be a part of the Adventist church. It was, it was designed not intentionally by any person, I don't think, but it was designed to attract the type of people that you don't want to be Seventh-day Adventists. And this was always demonstrated. Now, it is true that there were some true seekers that sometimes would join, but for the most part, they would quickly leave the church. The ones who remained, from my human observation, for the most part, were the ones who, and, 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 and it's, it's not maybe even as simple as that, but there was often people who became good Adventists, but they became good Adventists because they were attracted to that spirit that the evangelistic series um, manifested. Now, some of those um, continued to separate from the church in that they started to attack the church because the church wasn't as good as, you know, it should be. That is, they already had this spirit of I'm better than others. And so when they became Adventists, they still had this spirit. I'm better than others. And so they looked for the faults within the church. Faults in the church exist. But if you're truly converted and you see faults in the church, your first responsibility is to minister to those in the church that are suffering. They're often just going to call people out of the church. So, so it, you know, it's a little bit more complex than that. But just in a simple way, you can see that there's true seekers who don't join the church, often because they can see through the deceptions of the church. They're not interested in that spirit. There's those that join and, and have a wrong spirit. They, may, they, they become a part of the church. They're socialized into the church. They become just like the church that they were brought into. And then there's other ones who are like that as well, but they separate from the church. And usually it's just because they're not fully incorporated into the church, that they're often jealous of the positions that they are given. So, so this is what's happening to the Jews at that time. That this, this spirit that exists, and, and we see even in this movement that many of the people in this movement are of those sorts that were brought into the church with this idea of that I'm better than others. And, and that's why we have all of these different, uh, you know, beliefs. People will catch on to different sort of doctrines or teachings. 2520 is just one of them. Nothing wrong with the 2520. But if you accept the 2520 only because the church rejects it, and it's just something that you, you accept to make yourself look better than others, uh, then there's no benefit in you accepting it. So ho hopefully that makes sense, what I've said. So th this is the problem that we have here with the Jews. This is the problem that we have ourselves. And when by this means they had reached the point at which they were worse than the heathen round about them, the Lord had to take them out of the land and scatter them abroad among all the nations. And when they were so scattered, they were more separated from the nations than they had ever been at any time from the day that they came into the land. Because they were scattered among the nations, they sought the Lord as they had not in their own land, and they trusted him as they had not in their own land, and they found him as they had not appreciated him there. And his presence with them separated them from the heathen when they were scattered among the heathen. In all these ways, the Lord was trying to teach them that they were not going the right way, to teach them the true way in which it alone could be done. Yet in spite of it all, they took the wrong way to do it. Yet more than this, not having the presence of God, which would give meaning to all that he has said and all that he had appointed for them to observe in their services and worship, this self-seeking way led them to pervert the Lord's appointed forms of worship. It led them to make these a mean of self, means of salvation. And when they had practiced these, they held that that made them righteous, and the other nations not having these, 
Therefore, they could not be righteous. They held that God had given these forms for this purpose and had not prescribed them to other nations. And therefore, God thought more of them than he did of anybody else. Thus, they not only put themselves in the place of God, but all the services which he had appointed for another purpose, they perverted and turned altogether to the service of self-righteousness and self-exaltation and self-exclusion. Now, when it comes to uh, the Pharisees, um, because we know we have these different groups within Judaism, you have the Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees, the Sadducees are basically the sons of Zadok. They they are connected to the temple. Um, uh, you have the Zealots, you know, the people who want to overthrow Rome. You have the Herodians, the people who support Rome. You have the Essenes, you know, this group that uh, sees basically it's, you know, the, the, the self-supporting ministries, right? So you see these different types of groups exist, but they're all... They all have the same basic root problem. It's all about self-righteousness, self-exaltation, and self-exclusion, however they they try to do it. And um, so Joe says, if they had had his presence as he appointed for them, all these appointed forms would have had them, would have had to them a divine meaning and a divine life in every phase of service which God had appointed. Then they would have found Jesus Christ himself and his living presence and converting power. And that would have given living energy to every form that was appointed to all these symbols that were before them. Then all these things would have had to them a living interest, for they would have represented only a present Christ, Christ present with them. Thus the lack of the presence of Christ in the life by a converted heart led all together to the enlarging of themselves in the place of God and to making all the divine forms which God had appointed. Only forms and outward ceremonies by which they expected to obtain life. It led to the putting of these things in the place of Christ as the way of salvation. Now, I think we have just about time enough in the present hour to read some passages respecting what they had made Uh, of all this in the time of Christ. I ask you to think carefully on this. I have here some of the advanced chapters of The New Life of Christ by Mrs. E.G. White. Of course, that's the book Desire of Ages. And a great deal is said upon this subject, subject which we have studied so far tonight. And I thought it would be valuable to all our ministers and workers, especially, especially, and to all people also, if we could bring these statements together here where we can have them in the bulletin before our eyes to use in the time in which we are coming, time to which we are coming. I have therefore brought this down and will now read passages without making any particular comment upon them tonight. Uh, But the next lesson will follow the consequence of this. And all these points are necessary to our further study as the life of Christ is not yet printed, but still in manuscript. I cannot, of course, give references. He's going to read. The Jewish leaders refrained from associating with any class but their own. They held themselves aloof, not only from the Gentiles, but from the majority of their own people, seeking neither to benefit them nor to win their friendship. Their teachings led the Jews of all classes to separate themselves from the rest of the world in manner which tended to make them self-righteous, egotistical, and intolerant. This rigorous seclusion and bigotry of the Pharisees had narrowed their influence and created a prejudice which the Savior desired to remove, that the influence of his mission might be felt upon all. This was the purpose of Jesus in attending this marriage feast, to begin the work of breaking down the exclusiveness which existed with the Jewish leaders and to open the way for their freer mingling with the common people. The Jews had so far fallen from the ancient teachings of Jehovah as to hold that they would be righteous in the sight of God and receive the fulfillment of his promises. If they strictly kept the letter of the law given them by Moses. So um, I need to read that again. The Jews had so far fallen from the ancient teachings of Jehovah as to hold that they would be righteous in the sight of God and receive the fulfillment of his promises. If they strictly kept the letter of the law given by Moses, the zeal with which they followed the teachings of the elders 
gave them an air of great piety. Not content with performing those service, services which God had specified to them through Moses, they were continually reaching for rigid and difficult duties. They measured their holiness by the number and multitude of their ceremonies, while their hearts were filled with hypocrisy, pride, and avarice. While they professed to be the only righteous nation on the earth, the curse of God was upon them for their iniquities. Now, we, we can look at ourselves and say, well, I'm not caught up in uh, a multitude of ceremonies, right? But there's other things that can substitute for this as well. You know, and I've been always outspoken against conspiracy theories. I'm not saying conspiracies don't exist, but what they do to us is create in ourselves pride, that we know things other people don't know, and that this can give us the feeling that we are better, that we are in the know. Did you say conspiracy theories? Conspiracy theories, yes. All right. <laughs> that's, that's the fruit of conspiracy theories. Conspiracies exist, and sometimes some of the conspiracy theories that are out there are actually true conspiracies, right? Yeah, they some do. are true. Right, but they don't benefit us even if they are true. Right. Right, because that's not the message that God has given us. And um, so what, what we do need to do is to heed what Jones is talking about, to reflect Christ's character. If even true things can be used as, as a wall or as a cloak uh, to hide our true selves. And so we can be even orthodox in our thinking, but still all we have is self-righteousness. Believing the correct things isn't enough. We need to be converted by those things. And we need to be seeking to win those around us, not to make them our enemies. While they professed to be the only righteous nation on earth, earth, the curse of God was upon them for their iniquities. They had received unsanctified and confused interpretations of the law given them by Moses. They had added tradition to tradi tradition. They had restricted freedom of thought and action until the commandments, ordinances, and service of God were lost in the ceaseless round of meaningless rites and ceremonies. Their religion was a yoke of bondage. They were in continual dread, lest they should become defiled. Dwelling constantly upon these matters had dwarfed their minds and narrowed the orbit of their lives. Now, this is a, a kind of an interesting point that many people aren't aware of. Now, she talks about the dread lest they should become defiled. So remember when Jesus, <clears throat> after the Last Supper, he's going to be uh, uh, taken captive, right? And he's going to be brought to Pilate. And remember that the Jews don't want to enter into Pilate's judgment hall lest they be defiled so that they cannot eat the Passover, right? Now, they had already done many things against God's law. They had uh, brought in false witnesses. They had a night time trial, which was illegal. And also, if they had not yet eaten the Passover, now there's two different views about this. One is that this is just referring to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is going to be following. But if it is to the Passover lamb itself, it's supposed to be eaten in the middle of the night. And if they hadn't eaten the Passover yet, they actually had a greater fear of being defiled by the Pharisees than they had of breaking some direct commandments of God in the eating of the Passover meal. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? A little bit. This, yeah, this overrode every other law. It was almost like the worst thing that possibly you could do is become defiled. You, you could break all kinds of other laws, direct laws of God, but to become defiled by having contact with a heathen, that was the thing that they dreaded the most. They were in continual dread, 
lest they should become defiled. Dwelling constant, constant, constantly upon these matters have dwarfed their minds and narrowed the orbit of their lives. So much so that they could transgress God's law and not even notice it. <clears throat> okay, so now a question. What was the root of that whole thing? Self, selfishness all the time. So we've been reading from Desire of Ages. Now he, Jones has asked this question. So we know that this is self. Selfishness. Is our religion just consist of selfishness in the guise of religion? We have to think about that. Jesus began the work of reformation by bringing himself into close sympathy with humanity. He was a Jew, and he designed to leave a perfect pattern of one who was a Jew inwardly. While he showed, showed the greatest reverence for the law of God and taught obedience to its precepts, he rebuked the Pharisees for their pretentious piety and endeavored to free the people from the senseless exactions that bound them. Jesus rebuked intemperance, self-indulgence, and folly. Yet he was social in his nature. He accepted invitations to dine with the learned and noble, as well as with the poor and afflicted. On these occasions, his conversation was elevating and instructive. He gave no license to scenes of dissipation and revelry, but innocent happiness was pleasing to him. A Jewish marriage was a solemn and impressive occasion and the joy of which was not displeasing to the Son of Man. The miracle at the feast pointed directly toward the breaking down of the prejudices of the Jews. The disciples of Jesus learned a lesson of sympathy and humility from it. In another chapter, <clears throat> so in another chapter on Nicodemus and his visit to Christ, we have this. So Jones is just saying we're going to another chapter dealing with Nicodemus. At that time, the Israelites had come to regard the sacrificial service as having in itself virtue to atone for sin and thus had lost sight of Christ to whom it pointed. God would teach them that all their services were as valueless in themselves as that serpent of brass, but were like that to lead their minds to Christ, the great sin offering. Sinful though she was, this woman was in a more favorable condition to become an heir of Christ's kingdom than were those of the Jews who made exalted professions of piety, yet trusted for their salvation to the obedience of outward forms and ceremonies. They felt that they needed no savior and no teacher, but this poor woman longed to be released from the burden of sin. So this is, um, um, I'm not sure, it doesn't say here which woman, but um, anyway, I think we'll figure it out. Jesus was a Jew, yet he mingled freely with the Samaritans. So I think it's the Samaritan woman, setting at naught the customs and bigotry of his nation. He had already begun to break down the partition wall between Jew and Gentile to preach salvation to the world. At the very beginning of his ministry, he openly rebuked the superficial morality and ostentatious piety of the Jews. In the temple of Jerusalem, there was a partition wall separating the outer court from the apartment of the temple itself. Gentiles were permitted to enter the outer court, but it was lawful only for the Jews to penetrate into the inner enclosure. Had a Samaritan passed this boundary, the temple would not have been desecrated and his life would have paid the penalty for its pollution. But Jesus, who was virtually the originator and foundation of the temple, drew the Gentiles to him by the ties of human sympathy and association while his divine grace and power brought to them the salvation which the Jews refused to accept. The stay of Jesus at Samaria was not alone to bring light to the souls that listened so eagerly to his words. It was for the instruction of his disciples. Sincere as they were in their attachment to Christ, they were still under the influence of their earlier teachings of Jewish bigotry and narrowness. They had felt that in order to approve themselves loyal to their nationality, it was incumbent upon them to cherish enmity toward the Samaritans. Do you see the connection between that and the previous quotation? Talking with the woman of Samaria, Jesus had begun to break down the partition wall between the Jews and the other nations. And the disciples thought it was incumbent upon them to cherish enmity. 
do you see that when Jesus wanted to break down that partition wall, he did it by abolishing the enmity? <clears throat> they were filled with wonder at the conduct of Jesus, who was breaking down the wall of separation between the Jews and the Samaritans, and openly setting aside the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees. The disciples could not refuse to follow the example of their master, yet their feelings protested at every step. The impulsive Peter and even the loving John could hardly submit to this new order of things. They scarcely endured the thought that they were to labor for such a class as those Samaritans. During the two days while they shared the Lord's ministry in Samaria, fidelity to Christ kept their prejudices under control. They would not have failed to show reverence to him, but in heart, they were unreconciled. Yet it was a lesson essential for them to learn. As disciples and ambassadors of Christ, their old feelings of pride, contempt, and hatred must give place to love, pity, and sympathy. Their hearts must be thrown open to all who, like themselves, were in need of love and kindly, patient teaching. Jesus did not come into the world to lessen the dignity of the law, but to exalt it. The Jews had perverted it by their prejudices and misconceptions. Their meaningless exactions and requirements had become a byword among the people of other nations. Especially was the Sabbath hedged in by all manner of senseless restrictions. It could not then be called a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. For the scribes and the Pharisees had made its observance a galling yoke. A Jew was not allowed to light a fire upon the Sabbath, nor even to light a candle upon that day. The views of the people were so narrow that they had become slaves to their own useless regulations. As a consequence, they were dependent upon the Gentiles for many services, which their rules forbade them to do for themselves. They did not reflect that if though these necessary duties of life were sinful, those who employed others to do them were fully as guilty as if they had done the act themselves. They thought that salvation was restricted to the Jews and that the condition of all others being entirely hopeless, could neither be improved nor made worse. But God had given no commandment, which could not be consistently kept by all. His laws sanctioned no unreasonable usage nor selfish restrictions. The simplicity of his teachings attracted the multitudes who were not interested in the lifeless harangues of the rabbis. Is that, is that for harangues? I think so. It's just... Didn't know the U was there. But anyway, uh, skeptical and world-loving themselves, these te teachers spoke with hesitancy when they attempted to explain the word of God, as if its teaching might be interpreted to mean one thing or exactly the opposite. Both by his words and by his works of mercy and benevolence, he was breaking the oppressive power of the old traditions and man-made commandments, and in their stead presenting the love of God in its exhaustless fullness. The Sabbath, instead of being a blessing, was de destined, designed to be. <laughs> instead, the Sabbath, instead of being the blessing it was designed to be, had become a curse through the added requirements of the Jews. Jesus wished to rid it of these encumbrances. The Old Testament scriptures, which they professed to believe, stated plainly every detail of Christ's ministry, but the minds of the Jews had become dwarfed and narrowed by their unjust prejudices and unreasoning bigotry. The Jewish leaders were filled with spiritual pride. Their desire for the glorification of self manifested itself even in the service of the sanctuary. They loved the highest greeting in the marketplaces and were gratified with the sound of their titles on the lips of men. As real piety declined, they became more jealous for their traditions and ceremonies. We will have one more quotation. These admonitions had effect, and as repeated calamities and persecutions came upon them from their heathen enemies, the Jews returned to the strict observance of all the outward forms enjoyed by the sacred law. Not satisfied with this, they made burdensome additions to these ceremonies. Their pride and bigotry led to the narrowed interpretation of the requirements of God. As time passed, they gradually hedged, hedged themselves in with the traditions and customs of their ancestors till they regarded the requirements originating from them as possessing all the sanctity of their original law. 
is confidence in themselves and their own regulations with its attendant prejudices against all other nations caused them to resist the spirit of God, which would have corrected their errors and thus it separated them still farther from them. In the days of Christ, these exactions and restrictions had become so wearisome that Jesus declared they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on other on men's shoulders. Their false standard of duty, their superficial tests of piety and holiness, obscured the real and positive requirements of God. In the rigid performance of outward ceremonies, heart service was neglected. And of course, <clears throat> as I stated, uh, this can show up in many different ways. We can't make our religion a cloak. We can't set ourselves up as the standard in judgment of others. We need to seek uh, God's presence, his ways in dealing with others who with we, which we differ within this movement, how, how we deal with those that uh, we disagree with is much more important than what we actually believe about those differences. So I hope that this study here today was a blessing to people. Um, thank you all for joining in this reading. And um, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Dwight's going to be presenting at uh, 7.30 Mountain Daylight Time. So I hope that you can be there. And uh, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful once again for the light that you have given us. And we open our hearts to you, Lord, that you can show us our need of you. We know, Lord, that we've been uh, judgmental, harsh, critical, self-righteous, um, that we have not uh, revealed Christ's character to those around us, and that we've hurt many even in this movement by our words and actions. And we ask for forgiveness. I pray that you can bless each person. Uh, we pray for Jeff and uh, this movement and the things that are happening around us. Uh, we know, Lord, that we have a responsibility to obey your voice in spite of what happens. And we ask, Lord, that you can lead and guide us into all truth. Bless this Sabbath day and our time that we spend we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.